welcome to School of the Bible. We've been going through the entire Bible, 15 verses at a time, keeping it to 15 minutes. We call it the Bible mini-series or the mini-Bible series, simply because we want to compress it, encapsulate it, examine it, apply it to our lives, but allow for the Holy Spirit to take the portions that fit for us individually, circumstantially, but also practically in our lives so that God could use it somehow in some way to minister to us today. Not tomorrow, but today. So we do believe that it is the Word of God by the Spirit of God to the people of God, of the Son of God, Jesus, and that specific to the integrity with which it is written, that there is an integral specificity to the words that are being spoken here and written, and it was communicated to us as an oral history that now has been written down for us on scrolls and then communicated to us through time and by way of the Holy Spirit, practically speaking, giving to those men and interpreters and translators the right words to say so that we would have them today even as if God were speaking it when he did back then, as he does right now. And the only way that we can trust that isn't because of the way the Bible is written, but because of what the Holy Spirit does in us, giving us ears to hear what the Spirit of God would say, giving us eyes to see the particular and peculiar words that he causes to highlight to ourselves and to our lives. So we're looking in Joshua. We call it Joshua 15.15 because, again, it's 15 minutes, which we have a clock over here off to the left, and maybe one over to the right, or I can't see it that far away. But anyways, we have clocks around to try to keep it down to 15 minutes. So we're reading in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 through 15. And I'd kind of like to switch over Bibles right now to go to the larger size, because I'm getting old. <laughs> it's getting harder to see these things. I don't know about you, but you know, it's just one of those things that you'd rather read it in a large Bible than read it in a small Bible. And it's not because I'm more spiritual that I have a big Bible, it's because I have smaller eyes. So when the Lord gave us the ability to see those things with the Spirit, He kept mine, you know, kind of like out of focus. <laughs> but all joking aside, Joshua is an interesting word. Joshua is actually the name of Jesus. Now, you may not have known that, but when people say Yeshua, they're kind of making it a shortened version of Yahoshua. Now, that's Y-E-H-O-S-H-U-A, so you don't get all these weirdos, wackos, and wonderful people that they are going into sacred namers and getting all whacked out about what they think is the name of God. It doesn't matter. The point is just simply Joshua is God of salvation. Yehoshua is actually what the name of Joshua is in Hebrew. Translated, it becomes from Yehoshua to Joshua. The same way that if Jesus went to the temple, he would be Yehoshua ben Davi. He would be a son of David. He would be one of those that were treated with honor and respect in the temple. So Yehoshua was a common name. Joshua is the name that Jesus is. And if you wanted to say Josh then you would say Yeshua. So, if you get it, Yeshua is short for Yehoshua. Yeshua, or Yeshua, is short for Joshua. So, you, you kind of get the picture here. Joshua is his name. That's why it's so amazing to me when people start talking Hebrew, when you realize they don't know what they're talking about. Because they come up with these weird Yahoos, Yehus, Kippity Dudas, or whatever they come up with nowadays. They got the Yahooies, you know, the, that are running around, and Yahoo Choo Choo Chua's, you know. They put a hooey on it and get screwy and do all kinds of weird things. But anyways, forget what the name is. This is Joshua, the son of Nun, and you'll see that soon, but we're going to read from verses 1 through 15. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, into the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down to the sun, 
shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my service commanded you. Turn not from it to the right or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whether unto whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Have not I commanded you, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host, and command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals, for within three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land, which the Lord your God giveth to you to possess it. And to the Reubenites, and to the Gadites, and to half the tribe of Manasseh spoke Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest, and hath given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side, Jordan, but you shall pass before your brethren armed and all the mighty men of valor and help them, until the Lord have given you have given your brethren rest, as he hath commanded you, and they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them, then you shall return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses the Lord servant gave you on this side, Jordan toward the sun rising. Now I really enjoy the aspect of the reality of God being specific to each individual person and telling them and the tribe what they shall do, where they shall go, and what they shall say. I'm fascinated by the idea that we should meditate on and read about and study and have the words of God spoken so often that we would rise up, sit down, and do all those things that we're supposed to, you know, meditate on and consider the law of the Lord. Now, I think people make a big mistake when they talk about that book of the law. Oftentimes, you don't get the same impetus from the reality of what these people are going through as you do in modern society. Modern society, there are legalists that want to tell you to follow God's law here, now, in this society we live in. This society we're talking about that exists with that book of the law exists in a desert. They don't have any laws. They don't have any city ordinances. They don't have any regulations. They don't have any moral code. They don't have any legal code. They don't have any civil code. So the book of the law is all of societal laws, all wrapped into one. That's the mistake that people make when they try to become legalists. We have laws that say, don't cross the street on a red light. And it's pretty reasonable why we have that law. When you walk across the street on a red light, a car comes along and runs your butt over because you shouldn't have been out there. And that car will run you over. Just look around at society. The number one killer used to be automobile accidents. Now it's gun owners, but you know, what can you say? Gun violence is the number one killer in America. But number two is automobile accidents. The reason being is that there are thousands of laws about, you know, the, the DMV code is huge when it comes to operating a motor vehicle. Unfortunately, that's just something that's part of our societal laws that also involve other laws when you break those laws. Those are called civil laws, where you have to pay a penalty, where you have to pay dues, where you have to pay lawyers. Those are all the book of the law. See, that's what people don't understand. This is a society of people that had no law because they were in Egypt. Now God is giving them a law to govern their society, to cause them to become a peculiar people, a people unto themselves, but a people that have a law. It's kind of like right now, there's a big argument that false Christians are making about Muslims. They're saying, oh, hey, you know, they want Sharia law. So, they still obey the law of the land. If their Sharia law is more strict, what are you worried about? 
It's the same thing as true with Orthodox Jews. They have their own law. They have <laughs> observant law. You know, I was going to say rabbinic. There we go. Rabbinical law. They have law that they've determined for themselves to keep a society living inside of a society because they don't want to be a part of society. So they have their own laws to protect themselves from the ills of society. While the law of the land might say you can have prostitution in Nevada, God's law in reality for the Orthodox Jews says, no, you cannot. And yet they do that in some cases. Rabbinical law has been circumvented and treated as greater than God's law. So you've seen rabbis that have actually used prostitutes because they say they're Gentiles rather than Jews. That's not morally or ethically correct, but it is what they can do in rabbinical Judaism. So what we see here in Joshua as we're being given that God is saying, look, if you do these things, you're going to benefit. It's the same way that if a police officer says, look, if you jaywalk, I'm going to ticket you. And the ticket isn't meant to put an onus or a burden on you. It's meant to tell you, look, walking against traffic will get you hurt. So this will prosper you and benefit you by not doing that, not breaking the law, but keeping the law. That's why we get so weird when people start talking about, you know, they get into the New Testament, they go, well, wait a minute now, you know, that's the ceremonial law, or that's the, you know, uh, Levitical law, or that's Moses' law, or that's this law, or that law. Slavery in America was, at the time of the Civil War, it had been made, mentioned before, but at the time of the Civil War, slaves were free. Unfortunately, most slaves had no education, they had, unless they had been taught by the uh, slave owner. But a lot of slaves had no education and no proper understanding of what freedom was, so they didn't get free. And then carpetbaggers came in and abused them, used them, confused them, and stole land and property and rights and everything else until we had the civil rights movement that actually began to restore the freedom that was already given back in the Civil War. And the reality is that's what's happened here with Joshua, is that while God has given them a certain amount of time and a certain amount of experience of learning what he wants from them and how he wants them to live, they don't get it yet. They're a generation that was under slavery. Even Joshua himself had been a slave. So he has a slave's mentality when he's moving into the land. He has this mentality that he's seen what God can do, and he doesn't want to break those laws for fear of God causing repercussions upon him, sending him to hell, literally, opening up the earth and swallowing him. But that was to dramatize the fact that there are laws that need to be obeyed. There are laws that are for the benefit of the individual, laws for the benefit of society. There are civil laws, there are procedural laws, there are religious laws, there are corporate laws, there are, there are laws that dictate how a Jew must treat another Jew. And there are even laws in there that talk about how you should treat the stranger in the land, the sojourner, even the refugee, because you were once refugees. So it's not just, you know, I'm trying to get this across, you know, so you understand this, but you got to compare this book of the law, meaning that, you know, when they talk about the law and you talk about law, you know, versus grace and all that kind of stuff, you know, that Paul talks about later on um, in the New Testament. But when you talk about law, you got to talk about in America, all the laws that you go by, that you live by, you really do live by all these laws, whether you know it or not. The, the DMV law, the city ordinances, your county ordinances, your state ordinances and state laws, your national laws, the federal laws. Then you have banking laws and you have commerce laws and you have taxation and all of that. Now wrap that all up and put it back into Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Put it into Exodus. That's what we're talking about. So when you say, you know, to a Jew, 633 laws, he laughs at you because he goes, look at you. You're an American. You've got like 10,000 laws, which is greater or which is worse. So the fact of the matter is meditating on this is not a bad thing because God has a specific, has a specific way of treating each other that is based on love. And if you look at them and you treated people that way, you would find that you would be more ethical and moral in your business practices than you do probably in your normal way of defining the mores of society and excusing them from one state to another. 
in these laws that God has given to Joshua and reminded him to keep them so he prospered, it applies to everywhere they go, not just one tribe or another. You know, it's also interesting that we see that every place that the sole of their foot shall tread upon, I have given to you. Now, in modern Israel today, we have a bad example of a promise being abused, confused, and misused. The children of Israel never took the land. They never took all the land to the Euphrates. They're not going to get the land to the Euphrates until the Millennial Kingdom. So get off of trying to tell Israel to build illegal settlements in Israel. That's illegal. That's not what God said to do here in Joshua as he's getting ready to go into the land to conquer. He said, I've given you the land, but you must, with the soles of your foot, possess the land. You can't just get the land and say, hey, you know, I own it. Uh, you know, guess what? But uh, I'm not going to take it. So, you know what? If somebody happens to squat on it, squatters beware. In America, there are certain states that have, believe it or not, squatters' rights. They squat in buildings and they live there. And as long as they don't cause too much trouble, police avoid them, city avoids them. And basically, they're kind of left alone. Squatter's rights apply to Alaska, where people used to squat on and homestead land that they hadn't even been given. Eventually, Alaska had to come up with land property rights to say that even if you homestead it and you squat it, you can't have it if it's already been deeded to someone else or something else, like BLM land or national parks. So, on the one hand, you know, it's true that Israel has a promise that's going to be fulfilled one day. But on the other hand, you can't just go in and slaughter people today in the name of, hey, guess what? I got a promise that, you know, I'm going to come back into Israel, take the land. And, you know, since I agree that the United Nations gave us the land, now I'm going to disagree with the United Nations saying we have to obey the laws of the land. You can't work it both ways. You see, Christians are very mindset of abuse rather than use of what God has said. The soles of their feet. In other words, Israel today, even if they possess the land, could not fill the land with Jews. I'm sorry. When you go to Tigris, Euphrates, all the way to the Mediterranean, and you go north and south, including Lebanon, you're going to wind up with a huge amount of land that, no, just like here in America, will not be fully occupied. There will be big, giant gaps of no one living there, even as in the Negev, there are people where there's nobody living there. It's desert. They can turn it into farmland if they so chose to. It'd be tough, it'd be rough, but they could do it. They have the technology. So, one of the things that God says is, do it my way and you'll have it today. But don't do it my way and you're going to have a problem. And that's why we have the issue today with what we call Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, or Klal Israel, the people of Israel. Because there are the people of Israel and six million of them live in America. And then there are the people of Israel that 6.2 live in Israel. At least citizenship wise, and then some of them actually live outside of Israel, you know, some kind of quasi. But they got Israeli citizenship. So, don't get caught up sometimes in modern, messed up ways of thinking. Try to understand it from the perspective of where they lived how they lived, and what they lived. Slaves being set free. That's where we are in Joshua. They've just been set free. They've finally been trained for war. They've been organized as an army. They've had some success. They've been given some societal laws, some religious laws, some perspective laws, some moral codes, some um, uh, intellectual laws, you know, and ways to conduct themselves with God that we'll see, will they do that? Or will they fail that? And that's where it brings it to you. Do you obey the laws of the land, like the children of Israel were told to do in order to prosper? Or do you break the law? The choice is yours, really, either to follow through with what God says to do or don't. You see, even um, Joshua had to remind those that were going to be a part of the army to, hey, look, God gave you the land and we've helped, but you've got to come with us, you know, in order to take the land. It wasn't just simply a process of, hey, it's ours, so we'll just waltz right in and, you know, you guys, take, you know, we got ours, you take care of yours. No, you have to come together in order to help your brethren. And that's where it comes to the church, the children of Israel, and us. We all are saved by faith, 
but we all have grace to give to others that we should come together in order to minister to others rather than keep ministering to ourselves. There is so much about Joshua that's going to be true to the church that the church now is only saving those that are saved and isn't going out into the world to save those that are unsaved. And that's where God wants your feet to go. He wants the soles of your feet to go claim the rest of the world, not just to sit around in your living room, you know, and walk in a circle and say, hey, this is mine, because God's got so much more in store for you. God really wants you to be a Joshua. He wants you to be like Jesus. He wants you to go out and to conquer in the name of the Lord. But he doesn't want you to be content with such things as you have, because he wants you to help your brethren. And if that means helping the Pentecostal or the event or the the whew, oh gosh, evangelical or the Catholic or the Protestant, if they're out doing salvation, you don't turn your back on them. You go help them to save a soul.